the delegate from the Northwest. And we did strike up a, a friendship then. And I was really pleased when Steve got elected to the NUT executive in the, in the Easter of 1986. And we became very firm friends from that. Steve's potential in the union was obvious right from the beginning. And uh, someone who uh, really cared deeply about the union, often at times when the union was going through some internal difficulties, I have to say. But Steve um, was a, an obvious candidate to be uh, vice president and then president of the union. And he achieved that, uh, that role uh, uh, with, with uh, great support and was a fantastic president of the NUT. And partway uh, through his presidential year, he was elected the deputy general secretary, a post which he held with uh, great authority for a period of 10 years. The incumbent general secretary at the time, Doug McAvoy, uh, was retiring. So that created a, a very positive opportunity for Steve to stand uh, as general secretary. Inevitably, when you get a, a general secretary retiring, then it creates massive opportunities for lots of people to throw their hat in the ring. Uh, and Steve, uh, uh, very much uh, 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 when committed to standing, knew that it would be a challenge in the sense that there would be all sorts of people uh, wanting to be it. But I'm pleased to say that Steve won that election and he won it with a very positive message to so something which uh, uh, we often refer to. It was working together, winning together. And that's what he wanted to do uh, in terms of bringing together the union uh, and developing uh, the union at that time. So Steve, um, was uh, enormously committed to international matters, uh, fundamentally committed to education, and could see uh, some of the difficulties that were crystallizing in terms of making progress with access to education. And he devoted a lot of his time um, engaging in activities. What's on the screen now the, is, the, um, is actually the front of the uh, uh, sadly, the uh, commemoration, which, which was a real celebration of his life, of June 2008, because unfortunately, Steve died before the end of his first year um, as uh, General Secretary. Um, I'm going to just tell you a, a bit of a funny story, which, which is typical of Steve. Um, Steve, uh, I remember going with Steve to the United States, and we were doing some work with the American Federation of Teachers, and we, were, we initially went to rally in North Carolina and then we were flying to to Washington and we got on this plane and uh, the, the delegation was there's quite a few of us and we were near the back of the plane I, I remember it so well because uh, there was a strange event for me was that as we sat down a few minutes later a whole crew came on the plane right I, I remember saying to the, the the lead person oh goodness gracious me I thought you were supposed to be at the the front of the the, the plane and then a few minutes later, over the tannoy on the plane, came the message with Mr. Sinat, Mr. S-I-N-O-T-T. -T. And I just say it that way because that's how I remember it. Come to the front of the plane, please. And it was just something like that. And Steve sort of turned to me and looked a bit puzzled. So he got up and went to the front of the plane. And I could see him in detailed conversation with one of the cabin crew. And he came back and he said, I've got a problem. Um, they won't let my suitcase onto the plane because it's uh, vibrating they're gonna have to take it off well of course it was his it was his razor which had been set off in in the luggage and uh, uh, unfortunately it ran down the battery so they were able to put it on the train but he took that in good humor and we had a good um, laugh about it and Steve was someone you could laugh about lots of things very serious when he needed to be but I think that picture just really shows what the sort of person his personality uh, shines through that so on his very, very sad and shocking and untimely death, it just came completely without any uh, warning uh, in uh, April 2008. Um, some of us just said, well, you know, it's no good naming rooms or having pictures, but what can we do to properly reflect Steve's legacy and Steve's commitment um, to education, international education? And so um, myself, uh, Mary Sinnott, his, his widow, Christine Blow was then acting general secretary and the senior solicitor of the union at the time, Graham Clayton, got our heads together and we thought the best thing we could do, the very best thing we could do 
was do something that was lasting and meaningful and uh, uh, reflecting his legacy and commitment to international education. So we established the Steve Sennett Foundation. We did it um, uh, on, a, on a hope and a, a prayer. But as Gawain said right at the beginning, the union uh, wanted to support Steve's memory. And we often say about the foundation at the time, it was, it, it was uh, with the NUT then, as it is with the NEU now, but not of it. And I think that's important because it's a, a, a foundation which is run absolutely totally independently. So it was that commitment to uh, Steve's legacy which caused us to create the foundation. And it was the attractiveness of that concept which caused so many people uh, from across the world of education to support the establishment of the foundation. And uh, 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 the foundation has grown from strength to strength in a way which is, is absolutely fundamental, I think, uh, focusing on its core values, which were linked to send my ch 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 children to school, but then linked to sustainable development goals. And it's our contribution that we can make to getting access to education in developing countries in challenging times. And frankly, the current times are no less, if not more challenging for developing countries with, with COVID and its impact on access to education. So that's where we uh, came from, established as a, a, a legacy for Steve a, a, a small foundation, which we always say punches above its weight. We're not a big foundation. We haven't got massive resources, but we are a sustainable, agile foundation, I believe, one which is uh, can make a difference. And you'll hear from other speakers this evening how that foundation has made a difference and how that foundation is making a difference and will make a difference uh, going forward. So thanks to the N NEU. And thanks to you all for being here this evening. Back to you, Gwen. Thanks very much, Jerry, for that opening and for outlining both the work that the foundation does, but crucially where that foundation grew from. And I think it's a wonderful testament to the work that Steve did, uh, both within the union, but internationally, that that continues on and into the future. Um, and to give us a bit more um, experience of, of the practical projects and, and the impact that that work can make, I'm really pleased to invite our next speaker, Marie-Antoinette Korjak, the General Secretary of the Gambia Teachers Union, one of our sister unions and um, a partner with uh, the Steve Sinnott Foundation in a particular project. So Marie Antoinette, you are very, very welcome. If you'd like to put your screen on and unmute, I will hand over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much and good evening to all of you. Unfortunately, I, my screen is having some problems. I don't know what problems. I think it's the name because what we have is Marie Antoinette called Jack and it should be Marie Antoinette. Or, but notwithstanding, I don't want to waste a lot of time. Let me quickly say I am quite pleased to be part of this webinar today. Uh, listening to Jerry talk about the Synod Foundation in advancing human rights and the sustainable development goals, it was quite easy for Steve Synod Foundation and Gambia Teachers Union to blend because I can comfortably say we, if you like, have a common denominator. So for us, we met a couple, couple of years ago with Anne. We had a discussion and we said it would be a wonderful idea for us to work together. First, let me say Gambia is a small country in West Africa. And we are ranked 214 out of 230 in the GDP. So you can imagine it is a poor country. 84% of the Gambian population are poor, below the poverty line. So education is an issue for the girls. First, we started with the positive periods because we realized that so many of our girls we are not going to school simply because they cannot afford the ready-made sanitary towels. Because for, for a girl who is seeing her menses, Sometimes you have to spend a dollar, and if where you don't have three full meals a day, it is always difficult. 
So I have, we have worked with the Synod Foundation to train teachers on how to make reusable sanitary pads. We also expanded to Sierra Leone, which I'm sure ISATA will talk about. But let me also talk about poverty in the rural area. In the rural areas, girls are not able to go to school because some of them will have to walk six kilometers to school and back. So that being the case, a lot of times they have to drop. But I want to make specific reference to the pandemic. When the pandemic broke, 70,000 students were out of school. And out of the 70,000, about 60,000 of them who live in the rural area could not access distant learning programs. Because the distant learning programs that were being run by the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education were centered around the Greater Banjul. So CFC North Sub Foundation supported us to buy solar panel radios. And those solar panel radios had a great impact on the students because they were able to get connected to the students who are in the Greater Banjul area. Because without the solar panel radios, it was going to be very difficult for the students to be part of the distant learning program. So for that, the initiative was very well applauded. Steve Sinod gave us close to 550 radio sets. And that meant 550 or more homes were able to benefit from the distant learning programs. Then we, at Gambia Teachers Union, we are right opposite MDI. MDI is Management Development Institute. So a lot of times when these students come out from break, they come to the secretariat. They want to complete their assignments. They want to uh, you know, submit assignments online. They want to conduct research, etc. We had a discussion and currently we are working on a learning resource center, which once it is launched, it is going to make a lot of difference in the lives of those students who without the learning center, will not be able to access internet connectivity, will not be able to access even a computer or a laptop because they don't have it. The other thing we are trying to do with Steve Sinon Foundation is digital connectivity. In the Gambia, a lot of teachers don't have laptops or tablets or what have you. I know in UK you have students who maybe have similar problems, but it is not as acute as it is in the Gambia here. So the digital connectivity is going to be piloted with students in Brunei University. We are going to take a school, have, the, have it connected to the internet and see how best it will work with the students. Because some of those students have never even seen a television, much more have access to a laptop or have access to a tablet which I can remember when I came to UK with some of the students. I think we seem to have lost Marie Antoinette briefly. This may be a problem with connectivity. Let's just give a moment to see if she's back. Marie Antoinette, are you still there? Okay, um, well, unfortunately, this is one of the risks with technology. It seems that her connection has broken. So we're going to pause for a moment on uh, Marie Antoinette's description. Hopefully we'll be able to bring her back into the meeting when that connection is resumed. Um, but meanwhile, I'm going to move on to our next speaker to tell us about another of the campaigns uh, that the Steve Sinnott campaign, the Steve Sinnott Foundation has been involved in. We mentioned two projects at the beginning. One was the Rural Education Project with the Gambia Teachers Union, but the other was the Steve Sinnott Foundation Positive Periods campaign. And I'm really, really pleased to welcome Isata M. Kamara, the project manager for that campaign. Um, so Isata, you're very, very welcome. We look forward to hearing from you and the floor is yours. Thank you everyone. 
um, for giving me this opportunity to be part of this discussion. And as we all know, education is a human right. And the barriers that stop girls from not attending schools, which then uh, makes them to, to, to absent 50 days a year from school, is having their period, which is a normal bodily function. So the, the, the usual selling point of the positive period program is to train teachers, women and young girls. This is a skill that they will learn and teach other people in their community and everywhere they go. These are things that are affordable. They are accessible and they are available. They are also environmentally friendly because when using this positive period pad, you can't throw them in the environment, which we all know is very harmful to the human person. So they are very, very uh, environmentally friendly. They can wash them and um, dry them and use them again for, for a period of one year. Also, they are our local materials. In the previous days, we used them but they were not transformed as now we are using them now. They are more comfortable now as compared to before. They are, they are in, in order for us to manage our dignity and pride, this uh, project was brought to us by Steve Sinot in collaboration with Marie Antoinette. So thank you very much for helping our girls here for not absenting from school. Now our girls can attend school. The absenteeism rate has, is now reducing. Most importantly, they are now attending schools. They will not give excuse for not going to school because of their, their, their menstruation period. Because they, these parts are things that we make, and we, you can even take them to school. You put them in a bag and take them to school. And we are also training these teachers on hygiene, because like especially the home economics teachers, they have gone through those trainings. They know how to keep water, soap, and educate them on how to wash them, dry them properly, and keep them in a safe bag, which we also train them how to prepare them. So these are the things, and we they, it has also helped us to break the taboo of talking about menstrual period. When I was a little girl, if my my teacher, if a male teacher, go into the class and want to talk about menstruation, we were like giving some funny sounds, all these things. Some girls would be like shy and said, "Okay, ask the boys out." But now, now that we've started this positive period program. Even the boys are now competing with the girls. I even have some photos that you can see the boys are now doing well, they cut well, they can cut the parts, they can sew them well and give them to their mothers and sisters. They are doing best. We, we did it because we want inclusion. When you say education, you know, we don't only focus on the girls because women are also the ones who give back to, to men. So we want, we, we include them, they also can be part of it so that we can have a sustainable program. Thank you. In some of the, the schools that we are operating for now in the Northern region in Makeni, Bombali District, Sierra Leone, um, we are operating with seven schools and um, we have over 60 teachers that we train to also train the girls. And in some of these schools, because we are targeting the most vulnerable girls, they are the ones that we are targeting. And uh, we targeted um, 150 girls from each school. So we, we now have um, 650 students that we are now monitoring and uh, helping. And being that I, we have, Sign an MOU with um, SLTU Sierra Leone Teachers Union 
in collaboration with um, with Pinot. So I have now a space, a, a, a safe space where I can discuss things with students that are facing difficulties in their schools or to speak to their teachers. So have a, a safe space there now also. So thank you. If I have something to say about the period program, this is all I have for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Isata, for uh, telling us what impact that programme has had in terms of supporting girls' education. And we know how vital it is to ensure that everybody, including all our girls, get that full education. Um, I'm now really pleased to welcome as our next panellist, Anne Beatty. Anne is the Chief Executive of the Steve Sinnott Foundation, and Anne's going to tell us a bit more about their work, but also about how, uh, what you can do to support the Steve Sinnott Foundation and the vital work that it does. So, Anne, thank you so much for joining us this evening. You're very, very welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for having us this evening. Thank you everyone who's given up your time to join us as well. I know it was said at the beginning that it's a very busy time of year. So you've heard from Isata and Marie Antoinette about two of the projects. And we started this year with much positivity and excitement for our projects for the year ahead. I was um, in Cuba in February speaking at a conference on sustainability in education and our positive periods program. And um, I even learned how to make the period pads myself so I could teach women in Cuba to keep costs low. I don't normally do the training myself, but we thought it was a win-win opportunity. So I can now say hand on heart that if I can make them, anyone can. Um, in March then we were in lockdown, as everybody's well aware due to the pandemic that was affecting most countries in the world. And although schools are reopened in many countries, many children may never return to school. And for those that do, their education has been interrupted and in a huge way. Um, we've had to look at a new way of working and moving projects online where possible, whilst trying to keep everyone safe and learning. We've had to be flexible and open-minded to how projects might work in the future. Um, I just wanted to give you some of the highlights of this year. We've kept over 5,000 children learning in the Gambia through the provision of solar radios. And work is nearly complete on our third learning resource center, which is opening in the Gambia in the new year. Sorry, I've got a little fly, sorry. Um, we've, we've had to adapt. So we've been sharing learning through online storytelling sessions and setting up the lifelong learning webinar series. The partners and teachers we work with are doing amazing work across the globe. And we've been trialing ways to share some of this learning. So it's available to an ever widening audience. The webinars are carefully selected to support teaching and learning, and they may also support building business skills, creativity and well-being. ICITA has talked, and so has Marie Antoinette, about the Positive Periods project. And this is a project that we're particularly proud of at the foundation because it's had a huge effect and a huge reach. As Jerry said earlier, we're a small foundation, but we have a big reach because we work with partners and teachers in, in the countries which we're operating in. And I'm really excited to tell you that following on from the training we did in February or January this year, um, they're starting a different type of positive periods project in Havana. And this project is going to be grandmothers teaching their daughters and granddaughters how to make the period pads. And they'll also get a chance to spend quality family time together as well whilst learning new skills. We're also uh, still supporting the literacy projects in Creole in Haiti, and we're just about to support a project with some continued learning in Cambodia as well. Um, so I guess one thing that the pandemic has illustrated to everyone is how connected we all are to each other. 
and why it's really important that we work in global education. We do not exist in bubbles. Our groups are made up of people in other groups who are connected to more groups and so on. We have not just seen the virus spread rapidly through a country, but across the world. And that's really shown us how we are connected globally, I think. And it's the same for education as well. If we are able to get access to quality education right in one country, the problems caused by lack of education in other countries are still going to affect everyone globally. So I think lack of education and therefore opportunities is something that we're really passionate about changing. We believe that education is a human right for all children. It should not matter where you, they were born, who they were born to or their gender. All children should expect access to a quality education as that gives them choices for their future. The Steve Sinnott Foundation is working at a grassroots level to make a change to education across the globe. We do this by working in partnership with teachers on the ground who scope and manage each project locally. It's really important that it's fit for purpose and it respects the local culture. For example, on the Positive Periods project, it, periods or menstruation or sanitary products, period products, in different countries, they're called different things. And so you have to respect that. And so we want to make sure that the projects are fit for purpose and they respect the local culture and that they're sustainable and where possible replicable. We at the foundation work with teachers to create independence, not dependency. So um, I'm gonna take a breath and let you know <laughs> what you can do to support us. Um, so you can help us with research and resources. Uh, one of the things that we're really proud of is that we reciprocate learning at the foundation. So we're always wanting to share learning with our partners. Teachers have lots of stuff to share and lots of good practice. So you can write articles for Engage or for our blog, we've got a blog now, and it really would be fantastic if we can share all teaching and learning practices globally. We would love to work more closely with international solidarity officers, so please invite us to work with you. People from the team are very happy to come to districts and talk with members about our work and how you can get involved in a bit more detail. One of the big things I've been asked by one of my colleagues, Lucy, to tell you all about is to follow us on social media and like and comment so that we get our engagement levels up and get our work out to a wider audience. And subscribe to our YouTube channel, please, if you can, because apparently that unlocks other tools that we can use. <laughs> um, I'm not an expert, but yes, that's what I've been told. Um, and I think finally, the most important thing that you can do is go back to your districts and ask them to support our work. It costs £25 for a good quality solar radio, which provides lessons for at least 10 children. So £500 would buy 20 radios and support over, I think, 200 children to access learning. But I'm sure the maths teachers around will correct me if I've got that sum wrong. I hope I haven't. Um, and the materials and training for making five reusable uh, period pads, which last a girl up to three years, is about three pound. It varies slightly in each country. So if you donated 10 pound a month, that is supporting quite a lot of girls in a year. And once a girl has learned this skill, she can manage her periods independently and with dignity and pride. And most importantly, she can go to school every day. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Anne. And some really important messages there, I think, about what we can do practically to support the work of the foundation. Uh, get engaged, follow them on social media. You're in front of your computer now, maybe got your phone in your pocket, then search them on Twitter, on YouTube. Um, Get, put your international solidarity officer in touch with the Steve Sinnott Foundation. And if you don't have an international solidarity officer in your union district, 
then please do elect one. Consider standing yourself as International Solidarity Officer. We're building the network right across the union and the Steve Sinnott Foundation is a key partner for those officers to engage with, but also uh, do raise it in your district and let's get some donations and some support to the Steve Sinnott Foundation for this vital work. If you've got any questions, we've got about 20 minutes now for questions. If you've got any questions that you'd like to ask of any of our panelists, please do pop them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen so we can pass them on. And we've had a couple already, and I'm just going to put um, the first couple of questions to you now. So. So the first are around the um, solar radios program. Are you able to explain a little bit more about how the program worked in practice um, and how the community responded to that program, what long-term impact it's had? Um, I'll, I'll open that up, but uh, uh, Anne, would you like to come back on that first of all? Um, yes, how it worked in practice is that um, the Gambia Teachers Union, they uh, made all the arrangements, so they purchased the solar radios and they were particularly concerned uh, with getting them out to the rural areas, so um, they did that and um, then they also did some sensitization lessons, so they went to a local radio station and did some broadcasting, uh, particularly around um, girls getting pregnant and that during the pandemic when people um, might be tempted to do other things because they're not going to school so they did some work around that with women and girls and broadcast some uh, lessons themselves and also the government were also broadcasting lessons so they were able to link up with that as well but it was I mean I I got pictures I can show people it was a huge operation of buying the radios and then um, getting them on trucks out to the rural areas and then um, training people how to use them and look after them um, because um, they are solar powered and you know just the general setup yeah thank you I'm back on the, the wow. network is just fluctuating it's very bad this Excellent. Evening, unfortunately Marie Antoinette, um, welcome back. Please do <laughs> continue from where you're up to. And I'm, yes, I'm so yes, sorry yes. about the uh, connectivity problems we're having. We'll come back to questions in a moment. But, but first of all, Marie Antoinette, do go ahead. You know, when the, as I said, when the pandemic broke, the schools closed for seven months. The first month, there was a big frenzy because the ministry was airing out um, recorded lessons to keep those students at home because a lot of them were out in the streets. You know, so many things, all these vices, all the vices you can think about, you know, came on and parents were sending their children out to go and sell. Unfortunately, the, the students in the rural areas were disadvantaged because they had no access to radio or television or what have you. So there was a big frenzy and some of our partners, some of our regional coordinators, the teachers who are in the field, you know, reach out to us to say, look, we have this problem, so how can we solve it? And then we have some discussions around, we said we wanted radios, but again, we were toothless bulldogs in that we did not have the means, we did not have the funds, but we realized that it was a dire need. The students needed it. Everybody was talking about it. So we reached out, of course, as we rightly said, education for all. We reached out to Steve Senat, and they were able to support us. As Anne rightly said, we have pictures, we have videos, we have everything that you can think of. Even National Assembly members spoke about it. Because when the pandemic broke, it was something that happened, not, nothing was budgeted for, so nobody had funds. Even the president of the country, when he was talking about response to COVID-19, they mentioned the solar panel radios and also what the Gambia Teachers Union through Steve Sinon Foundation was able to do. And that was why everybody was calling us and ringing us and telephoning us and sending us WhatsApp messages to say, can we have more radios? Because the impact was felt. Now these students were able to, guide, we sent out some pictures of students, 10 students, of course, with that time there was nothing like observing physical or social distancing because what they wanted was to listen to the radio, the, the lessons that we are being aired on radio 
So five, ten, five students, ten students, one student. So after the pandemic now, I'm just rounding this up. After the pandemic, the teacher said, look, that, um, not every child was privileged to have a radio. So now can we also have radios that we can use during our lessons? Because the lessons were already recorded. So we got some of those recorded lessons. We went out with another set of radios we gave out to teachers, and now they are using it. And you will see the excitement. If you see some of these students, they have never even seen a radio. Their eyes will even pop out when a radio you know, lesson is being broadcasted. And this is what brought about this digital connectivity. We realize that some students are so disadvantaged that they, they are not benefiting from what the unfortunately um, urban students in the urban areas are benefiting from. So that intervention was applauded up to, as I said, state house, even the president spoke about it. The minister of, Edu minister of health, when he was talking about the COVID response to GTU's response to COVID-19. This is just in addition to what Anne said about the radio programs that we are being out, et cetera, et cetera. It is a great initiative and so many other people are wanting to, you know, emulate that initiative because it is a good one. Thank you very much for giving us more detail about, uh, about that campaign, about the impact of it. Um, the, the next question that we've got that I'd like to put to the panel, is can you tell us a little bit more about the um, the impact of the projects that the Steve Sinnott Foundation has supported, the impact that they have on educators, on teachers, um, and others working in education in, in the countries that you've worked with, um, including what challenges are faced by the Gambia Teachers Union and, um, and any way in which the projects have supported with this. So, um, who would like to come in first on that and the impact on teachers? Anne, would you like to start? And then maybe I'll go to Marianne Tournette. Um, I think uh, one of the um, biggest uh, projects that had an impact was in Sierra Leone. We did a project um, twice. We had two cohorts of teachers who came from Sierra Leone to the UK and they were able to meet with um, teachers here and um, also take part in a training program. And it was about reciprocal learning, teachers in the UK and in Sierra Leone learning from each other. And we did that twice. And I was very lucky to be based in Sierra Leone when the second cohort of teachers came to the UK. And I could see firsthand the impact that that had on the teachers who came back to Sierra Leone on their um, teaching skills and the way that went forward. We've also um, carried out some training with the Gambia Teachers Union um, and supported them around uh, gender equality. And perhaps Mary Antoinette would like to talk about that. Um, uh, Marie Antoinette, would you like to say a little bit about that project? Okay, it looks like we may have lost Marie Antoinette. Yeah. Oh no. Hello. Hello. We yes, we can hear you. We still have this problem of people thinking the lady, lady's place is in the kitchen. And there is also a lot of gender-based violence in the schools, a lot of gender-based violence. You know, so let me just not talk about the students, but the teachers. Because you have a young teacher, newly qualified, posted 400 kilometers away from Banjul. This is your first time. From point of um, dropping you, you have to walk like three or four kilometers off the main road. You are young, you are vulnerable. So we have issues of gender-based violence and harassment for, mo for, for so many of them. So the training we had was to build their capacity to train them to learn to be assertive, to learn to know their rights, because we're talking, today is International Human Rights Day, that they have a right and they, they, can, they should be able to defend the right. Most of them, that was the first time they were in contact with any one of us as role models, with any one of us as mentors, any one of us as training them to be assertive. So that training had a great impact because you go to some of these communities, you have only one teacher, one female teacher in the midst of 30 male 
teachers. So you and the female teacher, most probably from the first day you are posted to the school, if you like most probably up to the last day of the term, you are not going to teach. Yours is just to go and cook for the men. They will say, no, 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 you don't worry. Go and cook for us. We will take care of your class. So that training had a great impact. In fact, the men were even complaining that, you know, you people are spoiling our women. I said, look, you people, you don't know what you're talking about. So that training had a great impact. Also, the solar radios, as I said, some of these students were so disadvantaged. And what was serious about the whole issue was that the lessons were aired for those people who were the examination classes, the exit classes, grade nines and grade 12. So without the radios, they would not have had access to, they would not have had access to the lessons. So meaning if they should take the same exam with those students who are in the urban area, of course they will fail. So that was why it was applauded. That was why, you know, the students did not take the use of the radios lying down. The learning resource center, as I spoke about, that is going to impact. In fact, every day they are knocking out on our doors. I'm sending on pictures of progress that we are making every day. And every day they are knocking on our doors to ask, how far have you gone? Positive periods, both teachers and students benefited. Because you are in a rural area, there is no shop. You don't have any access to pads, sanitary pads, ready-made sanitary pads. So when it's time for you to see your menses, it's all about clothes and rags and pieces and what have you, or staying at home for both teachers and students. So the training was beneficial to both the teachers and the students. And of course, we it's like Oliver Twist. They are always asking for more because we have been able to train like 300 and where you have 20,000 teachers and you're able to train 300. That is a little drop of water in the mighty ocean, but very much appreciated. Very, very, very much appreciated. Thank you. Gawain, can I just add, add uh, a little bit? Yes, of course, Jerry, do go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, I, I think that uh, you've got the flavor now in terms of how the foundation is operating. It really is, as, uh, as, as uh, both Anne and, uh, and, uh, uh, and um, uh, Anne have said, it's, a... about, it's, it's about enabling, it's about creating capacity, it's about uh, uh, supporting that developing capacity in the locality and that's always been at the heart of what we've done to ensure that that, that we use our limited resources in the most uh, effective way possible and I think um, I remember very much the Sierra Leone teacher experience I mean it, it was a, a, a fantastic experience for those teachers to come to London to go to schools and experience uh, schools and also get involved in the pedagogy of teaching in a positive way uh, and taking that enthusiasm back and then using it to engage with others, other teachers uh, in Sierra Leone. And, and it, you know, it demonstrated it was really beneficial uh, to them. And, and, you know, we were talking about the, the radios and, I'm, you know, the enthusiasm which the radios have been uh, greeted with um, is, is really gratifying to me. And it's something which suddenly came upon us very quickly. And I think one of the benefits of a small foundation, it's not you know, bound up with great amounts of bureaucracy. We could act quickly and we could get the resources to get the radios in place quickly when they were needed. And that's what always drives us in how can we do things which have a, a, a real benefit in the locality, increase the capacity and enable the engagement for education and particularly amongst girls, because that's the big, big challenge going forward. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jerry. And I've just got one uh, final question for the panel this evening. And that is today is uh, Human Rights Day. What is the single most important action you think that could be taken to promote human rights internationally? I know that's a, I know that's a tough question, but on Human Rights Day, it seems fitting. Uh, what, what single action do you think would make the biggest difference to advancing human rights internationally? Um, I'm going to go to Anne first, then to Isata, then to Jerry, and finish with Marianne Fanette. So Anne, what single action would have the biggest impact in terms of advancing human rights internationally? I, I think it has to be um, the provision of quality education. I think, you know, the more that people know what their rights are, um then that's going to advance it i know it's a very simplistic answer but it's what i believe from my heart yeah 
No, definitely. And it accords with the NEU's values completely that high quality public education is right at the heart of that. I believe I've just lost Isata from the um, from the platform, but Jerry, what single action have the biggest impact on advancing human rights? Sorry, Jerry, you're muted. Anne's absolutely right. It, it's it's and it goes back to that core message that Steve made in, in, in that speech, which we you which we used to to um, develop um, the foundation. Education is the great liberator. Without education, you can't challenge uh, effectively. Uh, and without education, you, you, you aren't able to have all the understandings that are necessary to create uh, the, um, the dynamics within your community and in your countries about ensuring that human rights are valued. Uh, it's about democracy as well, isn't it? So absolutely, we need uh, greater opportunities for education, which will liberate everybody. Thank you. And Marie Antoinette, the final word from our panel. What action should be taken to promote human rights internationally? I think inclusive, equitable, quality education for all is something we have to do and is something we have to reinforce to make sure that everybody has a right to education. Once they're educated, then the rest will follow. Brilliant. Thank you very much uh, to our panel today, to Jerry, to Anne, to Isata, to uh, Marie Antoinette. Thank you to uh, our BSL interpreters, Nikki Evans and Sam Riddle. Thank you to the tech team, Celia, uh, Tom, Dorothea, everyone who has supported making this possible. And thank you to everyone at the Steve Sinnott Foundation for helping us to put this meeting on and for all the work that you do. As Jerry said, that, that vision from Steve education as the great liberator is something that is right at the heart of the work of the foundation it's what drives the work of the foundation and it's also at the heart of the values of the national education union and i know from the international department of the union that we will continue that vision and steve's legacy now and into the future thank you to everyone for joining us this evening and let's take that message of education and liberation out into the movement and build support for the Steve Sinnott Foundation, for the NEU and for the wonderful work that they can do together. Thank you for joining us this evening.